Welcome back to Pursuing the Daydream. On this episode, we are taking the older kids to explore a gold mine in Placerville as they are learning about the gold rush in school and want to see what a real gold mine was. 20 minutes, 14 stops. We are downloading the media, okay? okay. They used to have birds too. Um, it was a cockatoo. Hey, hush up on that harmonica. There are some folks here that want to see the mine. Well, hello there. Come on, step to the floor a little bit while you get ready to see the mine. I know you can't see me, but I'm going to show you I wonder if this is... You might want to think about how they dug this here stope and the drift itself. Well, I'll tell you now, it was a yep. tough, tough job. Let me tell you. But when you are following a promising course vein, you don't mind so much. Let's start walking wow. on down the drift until you see number two on the right. At number two. This is number two. Okay, next. Here we are Turn at the next it. stope. Take a look. Have you noticed yet how that water turns the white quartz vein that brown color? It's not the water that's Is this the brown? Quartz. It's the yeah. iron chlorite and magnetite dissolved in oh. the The water comes and goes throughout the years, but that rust vein is there forever. We miners say gold rides an iron horse, because when we see that brown color, we know we've got a good chance of finding gold. Iron pyrite has gotten pretty famous as fool's gold. Say, in case you are wondering, I'm no scientist, but I learned some of these names and stuff about rocks from my brother-in-law, Jake. He's, uh, what you call it, a, uh, a geologist. He taught school for years down in Sacramento. As Jake explains it, when the quartz rock was once molten way down under the surface of the earth, the gold sometimes got mixed in with it, and then it was forced up through the sea. And everything cooled off, and when miners like me came along, millions and millions of years later, well, it was just like somebody planned the whole deal. Well, it's kind of nice because it was like 100, 100 degrees, right? You come in here and take a quick breather. Ooh, is this number three? Yeah. yeah. Here we are at number three. I want to tell you something kind of interesting here. It's another stope, pretty small one, I'll admit. And like the first two, it must have been difficult because there was groundwater constantly seeping in on the miners at the time. But these miners are what we call pocket miners. They were just looking for the visible pockets of gold. Hmm. So though they got most of the gold-bearing quartz out of the vein, you can still see some stringers of quartz way up there at the top. And who knows, maybe there's still some more gold in there that they couldn't see. As you can see, quartz rock is real easy to spot. People used to really just in be in slate. here. Oh, by the way, Pink most of the rock in here, black and brown, is called slate. Although they didn't mine it here, because <laughs> they were just after that gold, slate had its uses too. For chalkboards, roofing shingles, pathways, huh. billiard tables, and so on. Well, I guess it's time to move on to number four. So anyway, here at signpost number four is a remarkable formation that shows just how powerful Mother Nature is. Look at the arch-shaped formation. See the layers of rock? Jay calls it metamorphic rock. According to Jay, those layers strips of rock were once the bed on an ancient lagoon. Millions and millions of years ago, unbelievably strong forces started moving stuff around here. Things like strong earthquakes and such lasted for days and lifted the whole seabed up until the waters were vertical. Incredible, isn't it? Well, I guess it's time to move on. Is it water? Yeah. It probably goes up 25 feet. They was following a series of gold-bearing quartz veins that looked like the branches on a tree. 
It started right here at the level of this drift and kept going up and spreading out. It must have really been something to see the gold that was here. Do you see that large wooden log wedge between the walls? Yeah. The miners call it a stove. We use stoves built to support the rock and the stand. Can you see more of the small So they supported the, the walls? Yep. When you're ready, I'll meet you at number six. All right. Now I'm going to tell you something about hard rock mining. What you hear is men drilling holes the old time way. Double jack, two guys working together. One holds the drill, or steel as they called it, against the rock face of the drift. The other swings that double jack or sledge against the end of the steel. This drives the point of the steel into the rock. After each hit, the guy okay, holding the steel tiny? gives it a quarter turn. You look right in the it right takes area. A while, but you end up with a hole oh, about three yeah. feet or so deep and as big around as a 50 cent piece. Take a look. You might see a hole or two. You probably already figured out why they're drilling these holes. Yes, sir, that's right. That is where they put the explosive. All right, let's see. You know all the drops of water we oh, heard you. It's just groundwater seeping through the rock. It's something us miners had to deal with a lot. We always tried <laughs> to dig the drifts with a slight downgrade towards the portal to help this water drain out of the mine. Otherwise, we'd be ankle deep in water along about now. Yeah. I know it's a tad dark in here, but look up at the ceiling and the walls too. That slick stuff you see here is called flowstone, which is being gradually deposited by the water. Okay. This is what makes those strange forms you see in those famous caves. It's amazing what Mother Nature can do, Whoa. isn't it? Oh, it's time to move along, so we will go to number eight. Look out for it on the right, just ahead. Oh. Well, here we are at number eight. It is rather dark here, but if you look real carefully, you'll see another drill hole just above the sign. Right here. This hole was a place where they packed the drill hole with explosive, but it didn't go like they figured it would. Huh. They just didn't put enough powder in. Hmm. Better for a miner to not put in enough than too much. Oh, you tamp in too much and you've got a cave in. We call this a bootleg hole, amongst other things. <laughs> I guess you figured by now miners got okay. their own language okay. for lots of things in a mine. You'll learn a few more. Now it's time to move on to number nine. Well, here we are at number eight. It is rather dark here, but if you look real carefully, you'll see another drill hole just above the sign. This hole is a place where they packed the drill hole with explosive, but it didn't go like they figured it would. Oh, no, we listened to that one. They just didn't put enough power oh. in. Better for a miner to not put in it. Here at number nine is a junction where two edits meet. Notice how they go off in two different directions. This is where they finally hit the ore they was looking for. By the way, ore is any rock containing a precious metal like gold in a paying quantity. Now look over your head. This shaft was a killer to work. But there was plenty of rich ore. It's kind of hard to tell because it angles some, but the shaft goes clear up to the open air at the top of the hill. It's actually called an air shaft. Can you feel the air moving? Yes. Yeah. It. <laughs> That's something. It's about 110 feet up to the surface. Wow. They had to go clean up to the surface because the air was getting so foul in here. They could hardly work more than 15 or 20 minutes, and they'd be gasping for breath. Oh, the no. fresh air made a difference. The timbering is a modern version of what we call square set timbering. It's supporting the air shaft and goes up 90 feet. The ore bin and chute on your left was for dropping ore down from above into the waiting ore car, which you see right here. Please press number 10 now. Please do not go beyond the ore car. But if you look down the drift at 10, next to the light, this is about the end of the mine on this side. Who knows? There may be more gold just beyond. But we can't mine here no more because this is a park and a protected historical site oh. for all to enjoy. That's I'll meet you at number 11 to the left of the drift here. Again. Look at those wires and the heading at the end of the drift. They represent fuses ready for a round of explosives to be detonated to extend this mine a few more feet. Meaning you drag along the ground. So you push here. The center post is rotated by pushing or pulling the cross arm as the arm 
cross arm rotates and moves the large drag stones around the stone pit. Typically, the miners use draft animals to move the cross arm, but on occasion, humans were called in to do the hard work. Gold bearing ore is placed on the floor of the rustra, and the drag stones grind it into a fine powder, releasing the particles of gold. Mercury wow. is then added to the powder to create a gold bearing amalgam. This amalgam is removed from the rastra, rastra and heated to evaporate the mercury and recover the gold. Mining ore with an arrestra is significantly slower than a stamp mill, but it is much more efficient. This pit is made of Sierra Nevadan grandonite, a form of hard granite rock that was typically used by the gold rush miners in this area. You show up. Um, a called? donkey. It would make it, you know, make it yeah. powder, and then they melt it. It's a hydraulic it's monitor. Monitor, yeah. monitor yeah. is a high-pressured. Water. Yep. It's like a pressure washer. Yeah. This would. This would pressure, pressure washer. It would hit the hills. Yep. And, and it would so wash it, all the rock yeah. and stuff out, and. So yep. Single stand test mill. They put. No, that's how they process the gold. It was like that, but a modern version. Wow. Crush the ore into a fine powder. The gold would be separated and recovered. The heavy steel stamp was brought down, up and down using a motor and gearing. Oh, so they crush the gold out of the rock. Yeah. They'd put that the rock chunks in there and crush it out. Under the stamp. Well, gold. this is the first version of a... The shakers. Um, what do they call those mining... Mining fans. Oh! They so what we just it. did manually, they did it. Yeah. They shook it and it would shake all the gold down. Hey, look, there's not a pin for our hometown. Really? We're right. There's no what? Right here. Oh. Cool, you guys. My name is Keith, and that is our eight stamp mill. The stamps were down here, there were four on each side, making it an eight stamp mill. Okay. Now, this machine was set here in the year 1900. And it's been here ever since. Wow. This is the original concrete base that it's set on. This that you're standing on was put here by the city in 1988 when they rebuilt the building. Oh, okay. okay. The old building looked like that little edge right oh. there. But it dilapidated and fallen down. The stamp was actually holding it up. Wow. Now the stamp was powered by water from the American River about two miles away from us. And it took seven miles of ditches and plumes to bring that water here. Wow. The water power and water wheel, which used to be outside the building, no longer there. Okay. That turned the belt, turning the big wheel, turning the camshaft. Wow, pretty ingenious. On each cam, there are two lobes. This is the lower lobe of this particular cam. But look at the upper lobe. It's pushing mm. up on the underneath side of a tappet that's attached to the stamp rod lifting the stamp up about eight inches. And when it reaches the end of the lobe, gravity takes over Crush. and down comes the stamp, crushing the ore down here in the mortar box. Wow. And the ore comes from the silver pine mine, which is at the top of the building. And that's why they built the stamp here in this location. And gravity is gonna work the ore all the way to the end of the building, the bottom of the building. But it's so cool because it's, it's crushed and pulverized into a powder as fine as baby powder, which they add wow. water to to make a slurry. And before that slurry can come out of the windows here or here, it had to pass through a very fine filter. And no large rock is going to come out of here. Oh, no. Oh. Mm -hmm. wow. It's very wow. fine. Oh, that's How many times have you broken into this? One man is being transported in Wells Fargo. Yeah. Oh, it's a little tiny one. Oh,
be like one of them's not working, but it'll look them over and they're all going at that stage. Yeah. Now, to separate the mercury from the gold, we use this little device here called a retort. They put the amount of gold ball down inside there. They put the lid on here real tight. It's an extremely hazardous operation. They turn on the heat. Now, this is what it looks like on the inside. So they turn on the heat. At about 550 degrees Fahrenheit, mercury vaporizes, leaving the gold behind as the vapor from the mercury floats down that pipe. On the outside of the pipe, cold water was circulated to cool the vapor down, condensing it, and what comes out of the end of the pipe is liquid mercury. And right back to the tables it goes. Okay, between here and San Francisco was a two-day stagecoach ride, and that's where I went to work. <laughs> Call me Black Bar. I robbed 29 Wells Fargo stagecoaches on their way to San Francisco. <laughs> 29 of them. Mm -hmm. Now that stagecoach would start coming up a hill. That's where I'd wait for it at the top. And the, horse, the horses would be pulling that heavy stagecoach up the hill. I'd jump out in front of the stagecoach stopping it. And I would point. My double barrel 12 gauge shot yes. directly at that driver. And I would say to the driver, driver, if you please, would you throw down the express box? It didn't take the driver long to throw down the strong box when he was looking at the wrong end mm -hmm. of a double barrel 12 gauge shotgun. 29 of them I robbed. That worked perfectly. But on the 29th stagecoach robbery, Wells Fargo had bolted that box down inside the cab of the stagecoach or before it was under the driver's seat. So I had to take an ax inside the stagecoach, break it open, and get the gold out of it. Okay, I put in the gold in my pockets, I'm ready to get out of that stagecoach, and a bullet comes whizzing by me. Oh! There was a deer hunter who happened to be in the area who saw what was happening, and he fires his rifle at me, and I had to run for my life. As I'm running, I dropped my handkerchief. Oh, and then on the handkerchief there was a laundry mark, FX07. Now, Wells Fargo was getting tired of having their stagecoaches robbed. They came to Placerville, called Hangtown in those days, and they hired our marshal, a man by the name of Mr. James B. Hume. This man is the Sherlock Holmes of the Old West. <laughs> he looks for clues to solve crimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. You can get him on the computer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, he goes to the side of the robbery and he starts looking around, and pretty soon he found that handkerchief. He knew that was a laundry mark, but he didn't know what laundry cleaned it or where. He and an assistant go to San Francisco and they go to every laundry they could find. And there were lots of them in San Francisco in those days. Finally, they go to one where the man says, that's our mark. We've cleaned this handkerchief. Hume says, you know, the gentleman dropped his handkerchief outside, and before I could catch up with him to give it back to him, he got lost in the crowd. <laughs> Seemed like a real fine gentleman, and I'd like to return the handkerchief to him personally. It worked. The fellow looked in his book, and he said, FX07 belongs to Mr. Charles Bowles. He's borrowing it. Full Can't give it back. Yeah. That's a pretty good looking guy, don't you think? Yeah. 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 Okay. I see the resemblance. Well, the first thing I know, I'm back in my apartment and there's a knock on the door. I open the door and there stands James Hume holding my handkerchief. I knew Hume, but I never robbed a stagecoach here in Placerville. I had too much respect for that man's ability. Well, I look at that handkerchief and I look at Hume and I put up my hands and I said, I give up. <laughs> I confessed to the 29th stagecoach robbery and I gave Hume back the gold from that robbery and that robbery only. 